a big hello to everyone and uh, i thank the shankara i foundation and the academy for giving me this opportunity to being here with all of you and uh, you know sharing my thoughts on uh, some aspects of how we can convert a thesis into a publication uh, so i'm not i am dr sabir sachi sen gupta and uh, i am a veterinary surgeon practicing in mumbai and also i am the director uh, and founder of sen gupta's research academy where i teach clinical research to you know residents and uh, fellows and whoever uh, is actually interested in doing good clinical research and publishing and i am also the associate editor of the indian journal of ophthalmology just a quick disclaimer that i am the founder and director of sen gupta's research academy and like i said i am the associate director of indian journal of ophthalmology and i'll be showing some uh, you know features of my academy uh, during this presentation and so it all really began for me in the year 2008 that's really a long time ago you know where you can actually see me and you know this is a workshop that i attended on research methodology and i think this was the watershed uh, period in my life where you know from a very novice resident i you know sort of metamorphosed into uh, you know uh, uh, you know someone who could actually understand research and publish papers in the next couple of years so i think it's very important to have you know research methodology training just like you have surgical training during your residency it's important to have this training as well and now this training is available online and this is my initiative uh, of sen gupta research academy you can actually take a look on some of the courses which are available here and you know there are fellowships and then there are uh, courses where we have more than 15 uh, 1500 students enrolled and uh, there are many other things which are happening i i urge you to take a quick look at uh, some of these resources you know so work that remains unpublished in one form or the other is essentially incomplete or undone uh, and uh, you know during your residency or sometimes during your fellowship also you go through a lot of different processes uh, while designing a study you go through you know randomization you do a uh, review of literature you do sampling and you know you do some statistics finally you know all of this should actually end up with an article in a journal so that is essentially what uh, you know we are all looking for and that is what we are aspiring for uh, so what i'll discuss today uh, so just a quick outline of what we'll discuss today in the session is you know why should i do research and what's in it for me uh, you know that's a question i really get asked quite often and then you know how to convert my thesis to a publication in a reputed peer reviewed index journal so every word is important there you know so think about it being a reputed journal a peer reviewed and index journal so uh, you know publisher perish was the old dictum that people used to use and uh, you know the current uh, dictum is publish and flourish that's because if you see over the last decade you know most of the uh, you know physicians who have been successful are actually people who have published uh, meaningful papers and who have influenced literature so you know it's definitely uh, an opportunity to flourish if you can publish and of course you know staying ahead in the race not that we are running like usain bolt here you know but uh, finally all of us want to differentiate ourselves in some way or the other so if you can be good at research and publications you know it really gives you a bit of an edge over everyone else you know so the first question is you know why should i do research you know doing clinical research requires a lot of effort and perseverance and has delayed gratification as we all know and you know most things in life are really like that if you you know if you think about it after doing a very good study there is no guarantee that it will get published and i'm sure that the question that even if i publish a few papers you know what's the use of these publications often arises in your mind and it used to arise in my mind way back in 2008 uh, you know and uh, i often hear the narrative that clinical practice on the other hand has a, has a lot more positives including much higher monetary benefits you know respect in society and given the odds that are stacked in favor of clinical practice over clinical research you know why should i consider doing any clinical research you know so that's uh, something that uh, we really all think about you know so publish at residency level i thought i'll break it down into uh, you know different levels where you think about this you know at residency level you really want to think about publishing because you want to get into the best fellowship right all of us really want to do that international applications you know to major international institutions like the singapore national eye center the sydney eye hospital and many ico run fellowships uh, you know when you when your application goes to uh, you know your mentor a lot of them actually look at how much research and publications you've done then you become uh, eligible for early career grants which are offered by the icmr and the dbt the dst and such other government organizations and a lot of us don't know how to access these but then you know that's a topic for an entire session and we don't have time to go into that but you know you really become eligible for that and finally you know you want to make a mark uh, even during your residency and at the consultant 
at the consultant level you know why you want to publish is because you know what your research can do is influence practice patterns you know, change clinical decision making and thought process you can influence evolution of literature you can even influence policy and funding from the government and finally want to become a better clinician i'll quickly show you some examples of these so this is a paper that uh, i wrote and uh, it was published in the journal of ophthalmology a decade ago and it talked about risk factors for intraocular penetration of capillary hair in ophthalmia nodosa and uh, you know what we showed is that uh, you know if there is hair in the cornea then there is a much higher almost an eight times higher likelihood of having hair in the retina or in the posterior segment and uh, you know i have got emails from so many different places including the middle east from you know south america where these diseases actually are quite common and you know people are, have actually identified a lot of these ct or hair in the posterior segment uh, after this paper was published so it really has had some influence on practice patterns this is another paper that we published when i was at arvind eye hospital way back again in 2009 and talks about incidence of post cataract endophthalmitis at arvind eye hospital and this paper has been uh, you know cited more than 100 times and this paper has actually led the ascrs to approve flash sterilization for uh, you know cataract surgery uh, pre cataract sterilization when you have high volumes we do flash sterilization now it is accepted by the acrs uh, based on this paper so it definitely has enhanced uh, you know patient care then the second is you know you can influence clinical decision and thought processes so this is an example of a paper which we published in the journal of ophthalmology and it talked about intraocular pressure reduction after phaco emulsification versus manual small incision cataract surgery and the thought was that you know iop reduces after phaco that's because the ultrasound energy is doing something to the trabecular meshwork and that's why iop is dropping but what we clearly showed is that iop drops in both these procedures and it really has nothing to do with uh, the ultrasound energy per se that is being used and so what it did is that, that it challenged the thought process that ultrasound energy is responsible for drop in iop and believe me a lot of physicians or a lot of researchers who had a lot of nih funding uh, for studying the influence of ultrasound energy on the trabecular meshwork have actually lost funding after this paper was published so you know it can actually have quite far reaching influences then you can influence evolution of literature uh, so this is a paper which we published uh, again uh, in jcrs and talked about incidence and long term outcomes of toxic antra segment syndrome at an arvind eye hospital and you know we know that tas happens it's not very uncommon uh, you know but uh, you know a lot of papers have been written about it but nobody had talked about long term outcomes so what happens to these patients at 6 months at 1 year so this paper talked about it and then after this i started getting a lot of reviewer invitations so this is an example of a review invitation quite recently from the journal of cataract refractive surgery that was about a year ago so i have actually uh, you know reviewed about 50 papers roughly on this topic over the last 10 years and so you know you can't deny the influence that one individual can really have on the way this literature on tas has evolved so and you can actually really influence literature if your papers really are meaningful then you can uh, influence policy like i said and this is a paper which was published in uh, indian journal of ophthalmology in 2017 and talked about definition of blindness under the npcb for control of blindness and you know do we need to revise it and uh, the chief author that is dr pravin vashist uh, you know an exemplary community ophthalmologist uh, actually the you know redefined the way we define blindness in india uh you know in sync with who and uh, you know this pap paper was actually picked up by lots and lots of press and see how the press is reporting they say number of blind to come down by 4 million as india said to change blindness definition right so uh, you know so this paper has actually led to reduction in the amount of blind that india has and the the funding which has gone into the npcb has actually dropped after this paper has come out Uh, so you can actually influence health and policy decision making this was a paper previously written about a decade ago which uh, you know influenced the way npcb was funded in the year 2011 so a lot of these papers actually you know are read by uh, politicians it's read by uh, you know a lot of ias officers before they allocate funds you know then what's in it for me additionally is that there is you know there lots of grants and funding opportunities like i said there's not enough time to go into a lot of those but you know, there is grants and funding there is fame and recognition uh, if you can be good at this and of course you know personal index uh, by which i mean is that publish meaningful articles that are cited not just uh, published you know because remember that once you publish the paper your job is done but the life of the paper actually begins so how many people read it how many people cite it as references in their own uh, uh, articles is basically what i mean by personal index so do meaningful research and finally we all of us want to be good clinicians you know so scientific deliberations during writing followed by good review process makes you a better clinician uh, so you will notice that you know you will start evaluating patient symptoms better you will start putting the science better your diagnostic ability is also become better as and when you you know 
you're actually dealing with the uh, editorial board on one hand, but the same thought process is uh, translated into patient care as well. So, you know, how do you go about it is, uh, you know, you go home with questions, you ask a lot of questions, at least one out of 10 questions will be the right question and you can actually pursue it and publish a paper. You know, learn from every patient because they are your best teachers. You know, keep in touch with literature and subscribe to e-table of contents of journals, which will give you a lot of uh, insight into what is happening, you know, what is hot and what is not. And, you know, the, the, the topics that you might want to do. And then of course, maintain records, registers, use registers or apps and um, you know, meticulously document patients' findings. So also let's remember that currently that imbalance is there because 90% of the world population lives in the developing world where we are and 90% papers are published from the developed world. So the really, the onus is really on us to you know, set this right. So take a message from the, you know, the first part of the talk is to, you know, research helps you really to go beyond one patient uh, at a time. And, uh, you know, so do good clinical research and publish meaningful work is sort of uh, the, the mantra to, you know, to be good at this. So we started up with, uh, you know, why should I do research and what's in it for me? And so I've told you so many, you know, different reasons at the residency level for fellowships, uh, you know, going abroad, etc. And also for uh, at the consultant level where, you know, you can really influence a lot of different uh, things that, that come along. Now, next we'll look at how to convert a thesis to a publication in a reputed uh, peer-reviewed index journal. So this is where we had uh, started before also. You know, so this, uh, most of the material is taken from my blog on Sinuta Research Academy. You can just Google thesis to journal article and you will get this uh, blog on the first page of the Google search. And so most of this, uh, you know, is taken from, from that blog. So, so what's the current scenario? I mean, do the, you know, do uh, thesis done in India in different, so many different institutions really get published? So we have, you know, almost seven to 800 thesis being done every year from India. And how many are really getting published? So we don't have uh, numbers for those, but this is a paper that I looked at uh, publication rates from the All India Ophthalmic Conference in 2010 compared to 20, uh, compared to 2000 and, uh, you know, are we really improving? And what we found is that only 12% I'll just repeat. So we found that only 12 public, uh, you know, 12 percent of papers that were presented at AIUS 2010 were actually published in the next five years. So I think that's that's woefully woefully small. So you know, so why is my thesis not getting published? You know, so many people keep asking me. You know, I've done a good job, but why is it not getting published? You know, over and over again, I come back to the same conclusion that there is you know, there is lack of training, there is lack of training, and there is more lack of training at every start right from the top to the bottom. So from the thesis guide to the thesis student, uh, you know, the, 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 basically the problem is with our system and not really with us because, you know, we are never exposed to this kind of training uh, during our, you know, during our MBBS or during a residency, during a fellowship. So, uh, you know, it's important and imperative that we think about getting trained if you want to be good at research. You know, so uh, before I tell you how to convert the thesis into a publication, let's understand the differences between thesis and a manuscript. By manuscript, I mean paper that will get published later. So, you know, IMRAD is the format used for a manuscript, which stands for Introduction, Methods, Results, and Discussion. And the uh, review of literature, methods, results, and discussion uh, are the way the thesis progresses. We'll take a quick look at how these are different from each other. You know, so first comes the introduction. So the length is much smaller for a manuscript. And the focus is on what's known and what's not been done, right? Uh, so basically you focus on what we don't know when you're writing a manuscript for a journal. But in review of literature, that is for a thesis, your focus is on what is already known or what we already have. So your review of literature is going to be much larger because, you know, you have said 20, 25 studies which have told us what has already been done. But then, you know, what has not been done and what is the lacking of literature? That is where we need to focus on when we are writing the manuscript uh, for, a, for a, a journal. Coming to the methods, the differences are again the length. So it is the smaller in manuscripts and longer in thesis. For thesis, the method should be like an SOP or you know the standard operating procedures, mentioning every minute detail. You know, so which nurse will take the patient from uh, say OCT to the physician? You know, which nurse will uh, who which is the optometrist who is blinded to this procedure, etc. But then you know uh, everything need not be you know part of a manuscript. So the manuscript has to be a pressy of the uh, the methods in the manuscript has to be a pressy of the SOP. So it should be enough for someone else to repeat the study without unnecessary details. Coming to the results, you know, the, again, the length is smaller in a manuscript. I'll show you a quick example, but the length is smaller in a manuscript and it's much longer in a thesis. A thesis basically reports on every descriptive, every analytic and every result possible. 
So many outcomes, outcome measures are possible and it can have as many tables and figures as you need to represent your data well. While a manuscript basically reports on a primary outcome measure, that is one outcome essentially, it is limited to about two pages on word and can have about five tables and figures combined. So I'll quickly show you an example of uh, you know, the results from a thesis. So this is an example of how you would write the results from a thesis where you will see that you know, the statistical analysis is quite uh, you know, prolonged or elongated. You can say you know, the results talk about you know, all the metrics that is age and then you, you know, show some diagrams then you show gender and I'll quickly take you through this. It's quite a long document. You know, so you talk about uh, pretty much all of this and uh, you, know, you talk about you, you represent it with diagrams with tables and figures. You know, so I'll just quickly take you through this uh, thesis uh, result section. So if you see, it's you know it's quite long and it's going uh, for quite a you know a lot of pages. So there are lots of uh, you know figures and tables, etc. So this entire thing goes for around 27 pages, right? So that is basically how uh, results of a thesis is is written. And then uh, now I'll show you how the results of a manuscript is written again. So this is how the results of a manuscript is written. This is the you know, statistical analysis section of the paper. Then you go to the results, you know, and the results are essentially you know, right done right there. And then you have the tables and then, uh, you know, that's about it. So it's about four or five pages. So this is basically how uh, the results of a uh, proper manuscript is written. So, you know, that's a lot of difference between how the two is done. And then there comes a discussion where again, the length is smaller in a manuscript and it's slightly longer in the thesis. And the discussion is more bold directed in a manuscript and it's not too different though between the two. So this is the only section which is relatively similar uh, where you can just, you know, sh short down the manuscript a little bit. So how do you convert, uh, you know, the thesis to, uh, to a manuscript? So the, uh, I will talk, uh, uh, you know, we'll talk on some tips in under each of these headings that is abstract and then the introduction methods, results and discussion. So the abstract writing is extremely important, you know, uh, it has to be a structured abstract and usually the outline is purpose, methods, results, and conclusions. The word count is usually about 250 words and you know, the abstract must highlight the salient points. Uh, you know, it's uh, writing an abstract is really an art, right? So Imrad really has to be maintained and it must be written after the con conclusion of the entire manuscript. That's the best time to write the abstract that is at the end. You know, remember that it is not an introduction. It is a resume and you know, here you tell the reader what you actually did in the study and what you want to communicate via this paper and most readers read the abstract only and that too can read the introduction and, and conclusion. So there are really two types of abstract. One is, uh, you know, the best one is the informative abstract which extracts everything relevant from the paper and serves as a highly aggregated substitute for the full paper. And the other is an indicative or a descriptive abstract. Uh, it rather describes the content of the paper or just gives you an outline. This kind of abstract, you know, does not, uh, does not serve too much of a Purpose. So this is something that we want to avoid. Then uh, writing the introduction, you know, so the goal is to narrow down the reader, reader's attention to your topic of interest. It should be concise uh, review of literature of what has already been done. And then you highlight the lacuna in literature and hence give you a rationale for the study. And then why is your question an important or an interesting one? So your, you know, the introduction should end with this. And I'll just give you a quick example. This is one of our papers published again a while back. It talks about comparative study of the incidence and outcomes of pigmented versus non-pigmented keratomycosis. So it starts with, you know, talking about corneal blindness. Then it talks about pigmented fungi. Then it talks about non-pigmented or filamentous fungi. Then it talks about, uh, there is a large series by uh, one or two authors about uh, pigmented, uh, about uh, pigmented uh, keratomycosis. And then really talks about, you know, so it says, however, little is known about the outcomes of dematitious fungal keratitis, especially in comparison with the more common non-pigmented keratitis. So we know a little bit about each, but we don't know in, you know, in comparison with each other. And therefore the purpose of the study was to, you know, so this is in a nutshell, how an introduction should be written. Coming to the method section, it's really a checklist where about these are some non-negotiable points should, which should be in your uh, method section. I won't go into the details of each of these. You can take a look at uh, it, uh, you know, when you're going through the presentation, but essentially we talk about ethics, then we talk about the study period, then importantly, we talk about inclusion and exclusion, then uh, we talk about sample size and how data was collected, what tests were done, uh, study protocol execution, and you know, what parameters were recorded at each visit, how many study visits were included, and finally, we talk about the outcome measures. Remember that it is, uh, it is a, a good idea or it makes a good impression if you define the outcome measure well in your method section. It's important or it's useful to use a flow plan, flow, flow plan whenever you can. 
and this is one this is my thesis which was published in the journal of glaucoma uh, in uh, 2012 and this is a flow plan that i usually like to use where on the left you see it talks about enrollment intervention and analysis and then you actually start from recruitment to inclusion exclusion and then you you know show the randomization and whatever groups and the outcomes so this is in a nutshell uh, eyeballing the you know person who is uh, sitting in front of you can clearly see what you've done this is a uh, flow plan from the drcr.net uh, one of the protocols if you see it looks quite complicated but when you start reading what was done it's really utterly confusing so this is actually much smaller uh, much smarter or much clearer then the result section uh, comes which is very important and the way you write it really makes an impression on the reviewers so uh, talking about the results you know initially you should start with uh, mention the overall sample size of the study then you talk about the demographics and you know for comparative studies mention whether the two groups were comparable even before the study then first you know report on the primary outcome then report on the secondary outcomes and then others tertiary outcomes like complications and then tabulate your results always keep an eye out for the figures and most journals want 300 dpi resolution which is very essential if you see this is a paper i talked i told you about this paper before it was on uh, you know ophthalmia nodosa and this is a caterpillar hair which is blown up 40 times if you look at the right it is blown up 40 times but then you know it has not pixelated because it was uh, you know clicked with 300 dpi resolution this is again on the left if you see you know this is a lactophenol cotton blue preparation showing the conidia of the fungi again it was clicked in high resolution otherwise you will never you know you won't be able to publish these uh, images uh, your graphs should be meaningful you know just showing line, line diagrams using word uh, using an excel is not useful you need to show some confidence intervals or you know standard error standard deviation something like that again you know so imagine this graph if you don't see the blue and the red lines you really will be lost as to what is happening so these graphs whatever you do should be meaningful again here these are meaningful graph where you shows you know how outliers behaved in this in this data set uh, then comes a the discussion where you know, the most critical part is this really makes or breaks a paper so the way to write the discussion is to recap the methods in short and summarize the positive findings of the study then compare the outcomes with similar studies from literature it's very important how you compare your results with other studies right you are trying to fit your results into the existing jigsaw so it's important how you uh, you know compare your studies with others avoid harsh criticism of other studies in case of differences postulate reasons for these differences it's not good enough to say oh we had different results and our results are more valid because we had a larger sample you know so that should not be done you, know, you need to give a plausible reason as to why your study is uh, is still valid uh, and it that it differs from all all others but why you know in case of agreement you should mention that too then of course mention about the advantages and drawbacks of your study and then the conclusions and future research scope in the field so that's basically how you write the discussion the success really depends upon how you write the materials and methods and then your discussion and then the results right so it doesn't really sometimes matter whether you found a positive or a negative result but how you did the study and how you are able to fit it in the existing jigsaw is basically how uh, you know what determines the success of your manuscript it's a good idea to use you know international accepted checklists for writing manuscripts so this is i would urge you all to go to this website it's called the equator-network.org and it gives you a lot of guidelines on these are reporting guidelines for different types of studies you know for example consort uh, strobe i'm sure you've heard these terminologies before so strobe is a mnemonic and it's uh, it's used for observational studies consort is used for rcts record is a checklist uh, used for reporting retrospective studies care is a checklist used for case reports so this is a uh, it looks a bit complicated but you know when you start using this uh, often then it becomes very easy for you to understand uh, you know which checklist is to be used based on your study type so in summary you know, why should i publish uh, is how we started this uh, session with and there are so many reasons like i said if you're a resident uh, you have might have different reasons if you're a consultant you might have different reasons but uh, you know uh, but you know, there are many many good reasons for you to start publishing and how can i publish my thesis is you know follow a systematic approach get uh, trained well i think that's really important like i said you know my uh, so people ask me you know how did you do it during residency i think you know i tell them about this and that you know this is the watershed uh, zone that uh, i was in and uh, uh, unfortunately there were lot there were not enough online material which were available then but you know now there are a lot of uh, online material so i have like i said this is my own initiative with pulse in the research academy where we you know have some online training Uh, if you look on the right you know you, you this is a good uh, you know overview of the fellowship that i offer where uh, you know there are some lectures and then there are hands on uh, on how we write results how we write the discussion and other things and then there is a live journal club 
and you know the uh, the teaching modules talk about literature review biostatistics and uh, manuscript writing and you know the website has some informative blogs you know on importance of p values on uh, regression analysis and some other useful blogs on you know interpreting odds ratios like i say uh, you know thesis to journal article which i am presenting to you today so you know i i'll finish by saying that you know uh, we are all in our com comfort zones on your left bottom but the magic really happens when you get out of that and so think about moving out of your comfort zones and you can only grow if you are willing to feel awkward and uncomfortable when you try something new but then you know the more effort we make the better you will get at this so train yourselves and i wish you all the best in converting all your thesis to to publications in the years to come thank you very much